two related uh, lectures here I'm, I'm going to do is what I'd like to start out with is to talk to you about uh, CORBA security uh, and find a little bit about what CORBA is and what the new security specification is. And then um, I'll give a brief uh, overview of our research project that we're doing in that area called the, the Sigma Project. Well, CORBA uh, has been an outgrowth of the distributed computing arena. Uh, distributed client server computing um, is an increasing role in, in our enterprises, both in business and within the DOD. Um, and distributed object systems are growingly becoming the foundation of our computing systems. And the object uh, management group uh, has been organized to define standards for distributed object computing. And uh, their framework they use for all the standardization efforts is the Common Object Request Broker Architecture, or CORBA. CORBA uh, is an emerging standard for interoperable object-oriented distributed computing. Uh, the goal of CORBA is to allow application-level interoperability across distributed heterogeneous systems. Um, the CORBA standard defines an architecture for object request brokers. So there's a concept of the middleware layer that does brokerage between clients and servers in a distributed heterogeneous computing environment. So as I said, I'll give you an introduction to the CORBA security specification, what the goals are, the key security features, um, how one might conform to the specification, and then uh, I'll highlight the Sigma project, which has three major components to it, ORB gateways, multi-level secure ORB functionality, and a CORBA-based MLS bar. The goals of the CORBA security effort is to provide a way to meet Simplicity, uh, consistency across distributed systems, uh, specification has to be scalable, must be usable. We want flexible security policies, and uh, I'll spend some time talking about that. Uh, independence of security technology. Uh, one of the aspects of the OMG and CORBA is that specific implementations of technologies are not dictated, whether it's an interface standard or specifying interfaces between systems, but not to tell you how to implement any individual system. Uh, CORBA also is meant to enhance application portability and, of course, interoperability between systems and within a heterogeneous environment. Performance, object orientation, uh, possibly the specification, security specification was developed so that one could write a security or uh, which could possibly be evaluated against the international criteria or the trusted computing system evaluation criteria. Um, and it has a concept of a trusted core play part of it. So these are quite ambitious goals and uh, quite extensive. So the spec is actually quite general in its approach to try and meet that. Um, it does provide a set of key security features, uh, sort of the standard ones one might come to expect at this point, uh, kind of if you look through the orange book or uh, other aspects of security requirements, you, you'd see these. So there's uh, you know, identification and authentication. Um, in a distributed system, we're going to use that to verify principles and objects um, or who they claim to be. Uh, there's authorization mechanisms, so we can decide whether or not an access between a principle and an object uh, could be allowed. And I think it's important to note those words principle and object, because we've now moved into a distributed client-server environment. We're not so much talking about a process or a user or a file. You need to abstract your notions up a little bit higher than what you might find in a standalone operating system. Um, auditing clearly still plays a role so that we can uh, keep track of what the accountable actions are. Communication security is going to play an increasing role in this type of environment because now we're talking about moving across a lo local area network or even wide area network type of interoperability between systems. Um, non repudiation also distributed computing is an important component so that we can have proof of origin um, data or, or receipt of, of data. Um, and in a large heterogeneous distributed system, we need to have features and services which uh, enable administration so that there are security administration services that need to be in there. Now, 
Now, the way that CORBA community works is there are different levels of conformance. Any given CORBA specification, there's sort of a, always a minimal level of conformance that an org vendor uh, can go out there and say can implement a set of services and reach a minimal level of conformance. And then there's always the next level up, which would be to implement a broader range of the services. Um, so uh, the level one object request broker vendor, um, his goal there would be to support security unaware applications or untrusted applications, which, which you might encounter. Um, and there, the orb is going to enforce the security um, invocation, whether or not it's OK to, to do an action on that, um, protects the messages, um, provides simple delegation, um, and some on access control. Uh, in order to reach the level two conformance in, in the Corpus security spec, uh, one needs to be able to support a security aware application that wants to make a call on a particular security service and provide the support for the administrative service interface. Now, in addition to levels of uh, conformance, there's also sets of options. So if you want to go yet another step further, provide even a richer set of services for use, um, these are optional services that you could include. Um, Non-repudiation, I already mentioned that was one of the services, so that at the application interface, an application can control, can, can tag something with a non-repudiation value so that you have proof that it got received by someone. Um, replaceability of security services. I said a few minutes ago, uh, one of their goals is to be able to be a bit security technology control and support a number of different policies. So um, you could have a commercial org that has some interfaces to security services but doesn't implement any of them. And they're going to wait until somebody else implements them somewhere else. Um, so you plug them in, in a sense. Um, you could have an org that uses interceptor interfaces. So that it has an interface to the objects and it intercepts it for you and has a thin layer there of security services and performs it for you transparently. Um, or you could have an org which actually uses all of the ser services at the object level for security services there. Now, um, one of the things that's very interesting when you, when you learn about CORBA and, and orbs is the majority of work that's been done in that community is really in the context of a single computing enclave and one org, perhaps, that provides you some application interoperability uh, between your Windows NT and your Sun and your Apple machine, they're all running in a county package. I and mean, that's sort of the, the, the standard place that you might see that, or a CAD CAM package that runs in a particular development environment. But what quickly came about, and I think much quicker than the developers of Corba ever anticipated, was once you had one org, then they said, well, I've got an org running in the engineering organization, and I have an org running in the accounting organization and the personnel organization. Now I want to get them to talk to each other. So inter-org interoperability has, has really become the leading edge interest area where, where a lot of work needs to be done and, and there's a lot of interest in that. So orbs are message-based kinds of communication and there's two approaches to interoperability there. Um, one is to just do messages on top of TCP IP. Um, the other is to add security in and use DCE, which provides you encryption and access control to some level of the cell and some authentication uh, additional to that. So those are another option if you want to do a secure orb and add those in and add the security interoperability aspect to it. Now, in the, the CORBA community, um, because you have these different levels of conformance and you have different options that you could implement, each org vendor then has to write a security conformance statement um, that states from the vendor's point of view um, what it is that he's implemented and what his conformance level is. So it describes the products, it outlines his assurance arguments. Why should we believe his security services? Um, why do they have value added to them? Um, how, how are they going to help the product enforce a particular security policy? Um, might have some constraints um, in order to do that. We talked a little bit earlier this morning in the class about how if you implement your orb as a separate process, you're going to have a higher assurance than if you implement it as, as inline libraries. And so perhaps some vendor might want to put that in his conformance statement two ways to run with the war, but what those trade-offs are. Now, it's important to remember that the vendor, this is vendor-produced documentation, and, and it's not uh, part of a formal evaluation. And I think that uh, it's very important to note that uh, you know, the 
vendor can, can assert that he has a secure orb and uh, someone in the government might be tempted to put that, choose that, put it on a product list and put it into a major system. But without performing an analysis of it, you don't know if it even has the services that, that they, they've advertised. Um, there is, in terms of the, what's the reference model or the policy that, that or, secure orbs are going to implement, um, really there's a, there's a meta model and there are models that apply at the levels of principles, invocation, uh, all of the major points, delegation, and in terms of policy domains. So the, the reference model that, that, the, that we're set up against uh, is a model which here's the orb in the middle, the client here, and, and object here managed by a server, and the client wants to make a request. And uh, so the, this orb is envisioned to be able to define when a client might access an object, um, what kind of authentication is needed, um, is there communication security needed here, should we be encrypting uh, as we go through, and uh, what should we be auditing. And so there's an implementation that's going to enforce the policies of the orb that's believed to be underneath them. The meta model rests on top of that and defines um, a wide variety of security policies uh, because in this kind of a corporate community, um, we didn't, we're not just dealing with the DOD, we're not just dealing with the commercial banking industry or different industries, so we want to be able to support um, a wide range of models, um, define abstract interfaces um, that the security architecture will provide you to allow you to implement systems that a policy, and then uh, in a meta model, we also capture what the guidelines are on, on enforcing the policy definition and doing a flexible policy. Uh, sort of moving through a range of models, there's, a, there's a, the trust, trust model. I mean, what, what are we looking for here? Uh, you're looking at what are going to be the threats, um, what's an application level model for the users, what the system have to do to give you the trust that you need. And the guidelines in terms of how to build it and the conformance statements. But these all come in as part of the specification. The threats that a secure org uh, should be able to counter is a unauthorized disclosure, modification, um, misuse by authorized users, um, repudiation of, of some actions, and denial of service. So if you implemented all the services of the security spec in the org, uh, then you've provided services which can be used to counter those threats. So there certainly are some implicit assumptions about uh, the users and the applications. And we, we want to be able to make sure you document that so that uh, the, the users uh, you know, have to trust their applications to do certain types of performance, to do certain functions. Um, we might want to have some limited trust in the applications and restrict the use of, of passing them privileges on uh, between different clients and servers. Um, you want to restrict credential propagation as much as possible. So if you are using something like Kerberos or DCE where you have tickets, you don't want to pass those down too far. Um, make sure that, that one of the requirements that we assume that we're going to use in this model is that there'll be identification and authentication so that we have an appropriate manner for enforcing that. Um, and then we have to have some assumptions of trust on the underlying system in terms of what they're going to do to provide uh, enforcement for security policy. Um, now, as I said, I mean, level one CORBA security or an org that meets level one security conformance, uh, the applications are not aware of, of security, but they still just want to do their job and operate in a transparent manner. Um, so there, the, the key functionality in terms of authentication, um, object invocation, um, movement of credentials, um, and non-interference between different objects uh, is, is all done uh, transparently to, to the application within, by, the, by the org. Now, how is a vendor supposed to use this collection of uh, interfaces, essentially, and standard specifications to build an org uh, that, that might have some assurance that you can believe is going to do something. And there, there's a whole section in the Corpus specification that uh, talks about trustworthiness guidelines. Um, 
I would say if for any of you who might want to try and look at the Corpus specification for security, uh, the document is, you know, huge, big specifications. Uh, but one of the most interesting things from a security technologist's point of view is to read this appendix on the trustworthy guidelines. So actually, um, I've been talking to some people at OMG about writing sort of the, the, the uh, cliff notes to the security spec because there, there's really about 30 pages that, that are very interesting from a security engineering point of view that you could read and, and get a lot out of and understand a lot about corporate security without having to read all of the interface definitions that, that come through in, in, in the middle of it. So, uh, the guidelines um, recognize that there are different kinds of security requirements. Not one model can address it all. It provides guidelines for or vendors in how to have flexible architectures, but have some meaning, some teeth in there in security enforcement, um, and have different levels of assurance that can be addressed all within the framework of the security reference model. And based on that, then coming back to the notion that once vendor has built his secure orb, he has to write this conformance statement. Um, as I said, it, it really, you have to remember it's vendor produced. Um, it's talked about what trade-offs you've made. Um, it allows you to make some informed decisions about it. Um, I think that here, uh, it's very uh, important, as I've said before, is you know, beware of uh, security by emphatic assertion. It's very easy for the vendor to assert the security services of the org, but if you don't understand how to use them, uh, you're not going to gain anything. Um, the conformance statement that a vendor will give you um, has to have these parts uh, to them. Um, orgs are just now coming out with security services, and I have not yet seen a conformance statement. So we've now seen a little bit of code I just downloaded last week, the first orb that came out with security services implementation, and we're just starting to play with that in our laboratory. There was no documentation associated with it, so I don't know what kind of a job vendor is going to do in completing this, I mean, especially something like a, a philosophy of protection. That's something Cynthia and I have worked on for years. It's not an easy document. Well, he can't, he can't claim that he's CORBA compliant without supplying a performance statement. <coughs> so even from a marketing point of view, marketing is what forces him to do it. How good of a job he does is going to be up to us, the community, and the very informed security community to evaluate these performance statements against what they deliver. Now, as I said, um, CORBA, CORBA security even, you know, was originally sort of envisioned in the context of one or managing a set of heterogeneous applications in a distributed computing environment. What happens now when you want orbs to talk to orb? Uh, and so what's the interoperability model that we're going to use? And uh, there are various ways to approach that in the CORBA community. Um, you can have an interoperable object reference model of security. So uh, there, if the org would want to implement objects with a standard interface, um, when we add security in at the same interface level, then our objects are interoperable through a messaging system. We might want to do it a little bit higher level than that, not focus at the object level. And there, we have the secure inter-org protocol. So that's IIOP is the internet inter-org protocol, which allows two orgs to communicate over the internet. And if we add security to it, then we have encryption facilities, which provide us both transport level security and authentication between the different end endpoints in the communication. Um, many orgs are using DCE. Most org implementations have been done lately on top of DCE. And so there's another specification for inter-org communication with DCE, which is the specified security transport authentication So for interoperability, um, we want to be able to describe if, if the orbs, uh, if basically you have orb, two of the same orbs, what happens if they share the same protocol, then that's fairly easy. Um, and if their policies are, are going to be consistent, we both understand what we need 
by our access control policies, um, and we have the same cryptographic uh, algorithms. Um, but there are extensions to go farther, which is really the more interesting case, which is that we're running different orgs. Um, and there, uh, that's when you would look more at the SEC IOP as a way to have message protection for the, them, and then if you want to use DCE on top of that, then you have interoperability there. So, SEC IOP um, is the, the very flexible approach. I'll show you a fig figure where it sits in the protocol graph um, for doing secure transmission on the internet. Um, how you could establish security context between the different orbs, um, protect your message passing. Uh, SEC IOP is implemented at a very high layer in the uh, protocol graph, and so that gives us, allow us a, a way to um, minimize the interactions down at the network transport layer. So GIOP is the general inter-orb protocol. It's a very loose framework. Um, it allows message fragmentation at this level. Then there's SEC IOP where you would introduce the security attributes for uh, cryptographic uh, transport and authentication credentials. And then IIOP is a protocol that basically allows the two orbs to communicate over the, or over the internet and then here's your transport protocol of, of the network. Um, so in summary of the, the org spec, uh, summarize that and then talk a little bit about what we're doing in our research work right now. Um, security is a major obstacle in building large distributed systems. Uh, maybe the, the move to large distributed systems has, has really done security a favor because while you might have been able to bury your head in the sand when you were within your own uh, enclave or your own computing group, now that you've opened up and you want to use the internet and you want to use large scale networks, uh, you're going to hit security whether it's in the DOD context or in a business enterprise. Um, the CORBA specification uh, is, is certainly a very important first step um, in trying to address these issues in, in that area, and I do encourage you to take a look at, at some of the specifications. Um, the specs do include interoperability between different orgs. Um, it gives a very flexible approach. Um, there is good industry participation. Somebody asked me about OMG. OMG has over 600 members. And uh, secure orbs are going to play a role in GCC, LAS, and uh, DII Co. So we will be seeing, seeing them. Um, it does recognize that there's a need for assurance, and we'll see how well that hole um, can be filled. And vendor products uh, are expected in 1997, still 1997. Um, as I said, the first <coughs> came out last week, and um, more will be released soon. I suppose I could take one or two questions on CORBA before I move into Sigma. <coughs>
growing need for them to be able to interoperate with other systems, and our goal is to try and address some of those problems in these research projects. So, um, our goals, as I said, is interoperability between different enclaves, um, high assurance mechanisms for interoperability within an enclave, and uh, support for interoperation between trusted and untrusted enclaves. And we're going to do this in the context of CORBA. Now, there are other object-oriented uh, frameworks and technologies out there, uh, such as Microsoft has, has their own DCOM version. Uh, we've chosen CORBA because we see it in the growing presence of the DOD, but our research is not necessarily tied to CORBA. I think it could be translated into other object technologies. The community of, of interest that, that we're looking at is distributed collaborative planning. Look at a situation where there's a multi-agency uh, joint task force, um, some sorts of real-time situation assessment, uh, crisis management going on. Um, we're going to assume that we're talking about geographically distributed and managed recruiting enclaves. So each enclave uh, have its own set of administrative services associated with it. Uh, there's a large amount of connectivity to other enclaves. Um, might be through private networks like Cipernet, or it might be through open networks like the internet. And we have a collection of heterogeneous operating systems, <coughs> and everybody can agree that we can use CORBA for interoperability, so the question is, is, is now what? So, uh, just one picture real quick is, you know, here you are in one enclave, you've got your object request broker, and he's mediating access between a client, and an object server that implements some objects for the clients. Um, that's fine, you're in, in, in one place managing your systems, but what happens when we want to connect it? Now I've got two of those, and I have a network. Well, I just told you the Corvus specification says the way that two orbs communicate over the network is through this, this protocol called IIOP. Is that going to be sufficient? What's the security requirements that we have? And how do we control this interoperability so that only the objects that I want to make accessible to a client here are those that are accessible and not all of my objects. So we need some high assurance mechanisms um, to ensure that the outsider can interoperate um, only in the ways that I want to authorize them to. Um, our first approach to looking at the problem is we're going to use the network architecture um, to ensure that there's non-bypassability. So it's a perimeter defense mechanism that we're going to implement. Um, and we will assume that perhaps with inside each enclave, they may have their own sets of mechanisms to restrict access from others within the enclave. So we've really focused our problem on, on the inside-outside perimeter question. And we've developed uh, an ORP gateway. We have prototypes of this running. We've just delivered a prototype to the, to the MITRE Corporation, and they are assessing it for use in, in some of uh, the major programs. Uh, the ORP gateway is, is a single point of control um, or access to objects, to the object services of, of an enclave. Uh, it's going to mediate the request based on the nature of the request, what type of service are you requesting, and the attributes of the requester. Who is that? Um, it has a map mapping of security attributes from other enclaves. There needs to be some sort of a memorandum of understanding and agreement beforehand, some procedural policies which are set up that say, we're going to share this kind of data with each other, and then we can configure the org gateway uh, to do the mapping of different types of attributes. And it's going to enforce the enclave's policy about what it wants to export and make it visible to the outsiders. How does it do this? Uh, the access control um, can be performed on a per service basis, um, give me access to the map server um, on a per method basis, um, which would be to invoke a, a method on the map server so that it can compute the data for the landing in Bosnia, or it could be on a per object instance basis, which is to give me the quadrant of the map of the particular area that I want. Can also depend on the requester's security attributes. So where did this request come from? Um, we are using authentication mechanisms for this from, from crypto. It can be done in a very simplest way, would be through just who the IP address is, be authenticated or unauthenticated, or there 
might be a way to be able to look at some more detailed methods and understand what the mechanisms are there. And I'll talk about our authentication server in a minute. Um, access control decisions are made in the org gateway by a form of domain and type enforcement. We are able to do an access check based on this domain and type enforcement. So there's your network architecture. Um, the question always comes up when I start to talk about org gateways and, well, what about firewalls? I mean, firewalls are the other perimeter defense mechanism that, that we know and love. And here I would say that I probably would say, go ahead and put your standard firewall here in front. And, but org gateway access control mechanisms are too complex to put onto a firewall in today's technology. Firewalls are supposed to be simple, transparent, crystal box idea. And what we're working with firewall vendors to do is to put in what we call an IIOP plug. So when a message comes in from the network, it's an IIOP message. The firewall says, ah, that's IIOP. Yes, I understand what that is. And it's going to let it through the firewall, but send it only to the org gateway that's running at a dedicated port address. Now the org gateway is in a position to do the access control and the org gateway based on methods and objects and invocations and talk to the org that's running inside the enclave and, and provide which of these services are, are out there. Um, there is a, a new uh, Corva specification for IIOP through firewalls. It's going to be voted on at the OMG meeting on June 23rd in, in Montreal. And we hope to contribute to that along with two org vendors. So now let's take the org gateway box and, and blow that up a little bit and, and take a look at that. So here's my enclave that's running an org that's managing some object services over here. Out here, I have some application clients that could be in lots of different enclaves, and they want to access some of these servers, and we've agreed to make that available to them, say, for the duration of a particular mission that we're going to be collaborating on. So the message comes into the org gateway. The org gateway does two things initially. It looks up the type using this domain and type enforcement mechanism. So each method, each message, carries a type associated with it. So it looks up a type, keeps that. Then it also takes what's part of the IOP message in the field for authentication data, or crypto data. It takes that data and is able to do the other part of the lookup, which is who is making the request. So we have an authentication service box in here, and based on the authentication credentials which are being presented, it can do a domain lookup and assign a domain. And then we can do an access control check it says, based on the domain that the who is and the type of the what is, are we going to allow them access in here or not? And if not, it you know, goes back out, so then it gets forwarded to the org, and now the org can do the, the normal object request for open services. So here's a little bit more of a blow up of what we mean by the authentication. How could we do that? Well, as I said, first off, you could just do it based on IP address. You could use the IP packet. You use a uh, current IPv4, uh, you just don't have any way of authenticating or validating that that's the right IP address, and IP spoofing is a big problem today. But IPv6 is out, we're seeing increasing implementations of that, and IPv6 does give you an area where you can put a crypto seal on what the IP address is and, and know that it's, that's a valid one. In addition, the IIOP protocol does include a message security data field. And that allows us to have even a richer structure in things. We can have credentials, and signatures, and Kerberos tickets, um, SSL session tickets. We have a lot of information that can represent not only the IP address, but um, which client it is on there, what his sets of services are, what his credentials are to access something. So we take a combination of these two. We have to process them cryptographically through a cryptographic interface to, to do that. We validate what the credentials are that are being presented. And then, based on this validated set of very rich credentials, are able to derive a domain and feed that into the access check that's in the New York gateway. Now, what is DTE? Um, DTE <coughs> is a, a form of very rich, flexible uh, access control. Typically, access control in a distributed system uh, is a set of, of apples, um, like what you might see in these. Server processes are going to enforce those. Uh, there's a lot of problems with that approach. Um, Apple's proliferating. Uh, they're very hard to build, to understand, and scale well. Administratively, they're hard. Uh, you have fragmentary discretionary restrictions. 
and also doesn't really constrain one server um, from forcing it to access the, in, according to the rules of the access control list. So what we've developed is object-oriented DTE. Um, it's equivalence classes so that we can take those lists of apples and we can group them into groupings of classes of access rights and we can have coordinated enforcement between the different servers and have the orbs be able to use those uh, through the middleware layer. So that's the basic orb gateway. Now, there's also some need though, and there I didn't say anything about multi-level security. And, and the orb gateway, in fact, the prototype that we're delivering right now is running on an untrusted sign on Solera workstation. But there are, are part, portions of the community that need to be able to do high assurance interoperability both within the enclave and between the enclaves. And here, we've done some work using the trusted mock operating system developed at, at TIS um, to build an approach to multi-level secure orbs, in a sense. And we have two approaches to that. Um, we use what we call, it's actually distributed trusted mock, because trusted mock in, of itself is just a, a standalone operating system, but under previous research, we actually developed a distributed version of that operating system. So it's, it's a multi-node cluster operating system. Um, it allows, this operating system allows you to have what we call an OS personality, a higher level veneer running on top of the, the lower microkernel. And then you could also run your cost orbs on top of that. And you could have single level poly instantiated applications. You have different levels of applications running in each level. And this trusted mock down here below controls the access to the different levels of the orbs that run. So there's multiple applications and multiple cost orbs running into one in each single level of one personality at each level. So that, that's one architecture. The other approach is to actually have um, multi-level applications, which is something we see less of a need for actually than running lots of single level ones, but there are needs for the multi-level applications. And there we've developed an MLS CORBA interface that allows these applications running at different levels and multi-level applications to take advantage of the services of the distributed trusted mock underneath there. So, if you want to do interoperation, and, and that's what you're gonna need, if you wanna do interoperation between trusted and untrusted enclaves, so I might have some MLS enclave here, I might have a secret enclave and some very unclassified enclave, and they wanna be able to do some <coughs> application interoperability, then what we would suggest is that you could run the org gateway that does the high level access control you want on top of this MLS operating system which provides org-like functionality for you. You could go even, so then now you look at this picture, and you go even one step farther. The next step farther is, this is providing me the access control and the orb gateway I talked about in terms of objects and methods, but isn't doing any real downgrading necessarily. This would be only relative to what the, the policy would allow you to do in terms of reads and writes between the MLS and the secret enclave. So the third component of our research has been to look at guards. And there we have a host, which is a bridge between the systems. And they're gonna do it still based on core, but most guard work to date has been message-based guards, email type guards, or data flow guards. And here we wanna try and raise it up a level so that we can talk at the application level rather than just looking at message packet level, okay? And so we'll look at something that can intercept network traffic similar to a firewall um, and relay that application level message if the policy allows it to. Um, and when we use Corbo, we found that there's some very significant um, benefits that can be achieved because Corbo provides you standard interface definition. And so there's some benefits for both the development effort and certification and accreditation process. So just to summarize those, if you look at the two different approaches, um, typical guards today are a very ad hoc uh, based on message or the, the informal mapping of the access control rights. Um, there's no real tools for integrating those in, into the, the total protocol software. But if you just stand back and look at what OMG brings to the table in terms of the standard definition languages and the tools and the compilers, there's a 
lot of room if you can specify your access control rules in terms of your applications at a high enough level that uh, you can take advantage of all of these tools and standards that are out there and have a much quicker approach to, to guard development. And that's what we're working with uh, at this uh, GCPS to see if there's a, a room for an org gateway guard uh, to, to play in those architectures. So, in summary, um, I told you about three research components. I know it's very quick and, and there's a lot of meat behind each one of those, but there are org gateways for access control on interoperability between enclaves, and that doesn't have to be involved in an MLS arena, but can just provide a collaborative planning between allies. Um, there's support for MLS operations within an enclave if you want, um, and then there's an approach to security guards using Corba. Um, this, these slides are a little bit old, so, so I'd say we're actually more like two years into a three-year project, a little bit over a year left. Um, we have a, a language um, for defining the access control using DTE. Um, we have tools to process that language. We have org gateway uh, prototypes, and uh, we have MLS org functionality prototypes, where we show how to use TMOC to, to do MLS org work. Um, and we have the framework for the cryptographic authentication that I talked about in that slide where we can put together things from IILC and IP and use Kerberos and SSL uh, to do that. The, the prototypes are running, um, and we are working very actively with the community to look at technology transfer opportunities. Uh, it might be the case that I'll be demoing some of this here 